Morning, everybody. Sorry, that was loud. I saw Hunter's head pop up. He was like, whoa, that was loud. Sorry about that. Um, thank you for coming. My name is No Pictures, Sammy. <laughs> we talked yesterday about, I don't want to be on the board or the website, so, okay. Um, my name is Chad Cowan. I am the acting assistant secretary for administration for the moment. You may know me from my earlier days here as acting CIO, chief of staff to the deputy secretary, variety of other assignments that I've had. Um, Nelson, about 35 minutes ago, asked me if I would come speak, so I'm somewhat unprepared. Um, but we're good. I said, sure, I'm all in. Um, anyway, thank you for attending today's Preparathon event. Um, this is a national, we're doing this to support a national campaign uh, which, is, which is designed to help communities be smart, take part, and prepare for local disasters. Um, it's important that we think about being, prepa being uh, prepared for disasters in our communities because you never know when something could happen. And, and something that happened just a couple of weeks ago, and it's very personal for me, I'm actually from southwest Georgia. Um, Hurricane Michael ripped through the panhandle of Florida and then devastated Southwest Georgia. My hometown where I'm from, I've seen pictures of it, and it's just wiped out. Um, they're 200 miles inland and never thought that they would suffer the uh, ramifications and the impacts of a Category 1 hurricane, and they did, and it literally destroyed everything. They're agricultural-driven. Pecan trees that were 70, 80, 90 years old were destroyed, and you can't just plant a new pecan tree and get those crops. Um, so it's gonna take generations for all of that to come back. Um, in fact, I still have family members who live there uh, and they still don't have water or power and we're two weeks out uh, at this point. So they never thought they would be impacted, but here they are. Um, that's why it's important to, to be prepared. Um, we have someone who leads our agency our department, who knows a little something about being prepared. Um, Dr. Ben Carson, as a world-renowned neurosurgeon, uh, understood the importance of always being prepared and having a plan, because lives were literally in his hands. Um, so he recognizes the importance of this. And with that, let me introduce him to come out and talk to us a little bit and get us started. And then he'll hand off to Nelson, who will get the event underway. Okay. Well, thank you so much, uh, and uh, welcome to Preparathon 2018. Now, how many times have you in your life uh, thought, you know, I knew that was going to happen and I didn't get prepared for it, and just sort of kicked yourself? Well, you know, we planned to host this event a few weeks ago, but ironically had to postpone it because of Hurricane Michael, uh, which affected Florida and parts of the southeast. Now, while our disaster response teams are still hard at work helping thousands of families in that area to recover, there's really no better time than now to think about how we can be prepared uh, with our own families and what plans that we have should disaster strike us. Earlier this year, the New York Times published a comprehensive map of all the places where natural disasters occurred based on historical data. Surprisingly, there aren't too many places in the United States that are not in a potential disaster area. And it's a good bet that you and your family at some point may live in harm's way. Other striking fact about that map was the frequency at which some of these places experience disaster. So clearly, it's not a matter of if it's going to occur. It's a matter of when it's going to occur. And the purpose of today's Preparathon is to help you to think and to plan. How would you, for instance, handle evacuating an elderly parent who has a lot of equipment? Do you have the medicine that you'll need if you're away from the house? Do your children know where to go in case you're separated? 
where to meet up. And uh, what about your pets? What are you going to do with them? And do you have a complete inventory or pictures of everything in your house? Photocopies or digital file of all the vital documents? Are they in a safe place? Now, these are things that, that we can do, but so often we just say, I'll get to that eventually. And eventually never gets around. And then when a disaster comes, we're all worried. There's a myriad of questions like these that really need to be answered well before the disaster strikes. As an, as an agency, we've been blessed this year, primarily not having any disasters affecting our people. It's reassuring to me, in light of all the recent disasters over the last 14 months, that HUD employee headcount continues to come back as all safe and accounted for. And I want to ensure that that continues. It's important that you and your families become acquainted with the information on ready.gov and that you participate in events like today's Preparathon. And I just want to take this opportunity to thank you for coming to this and to thank you for the tremendous job that you do to help all of our citizens to be prepared and when they're not prepared, to help them get back to the right state of affairs. Thank you. Well, good morning, America. So uh, this morning, uh, we have the honor of some guests that will be with us today. We have a panel that will be talking about uh, things that they do uh, in case of a disaster, or better yet, before a disaster. Um, and we have uh, with us today uh, Suzanne Isaacs and Colleen Weiser. They are with the Office of Housing Counselor and Disaster Assistance Response Team, known as DART. Uh, they specialize in providing assistance when there is a disaster to our clients and stakeholders in the field. Uh, I have a personal experience of how good they are. In Puerto Rico, as you know, uh, they were hit with Maria, the U.S. Virgin Islands, and Puerto Rico. Uh, there was no power. Uh, there's still some places in Puerto Rico where there's no electricity. So uh, sometimes we hear stories about two weeks, three weeks, a month without electricity. Well, some of our fellow Americans in Puerto Rico still do not have power. So uh, it helps to be prepared when things like this happen. So uh, from the office, as I mentioned, from Housing Counselor, we have Suzanne Isaacs and Colleen Weiser. We also have with us uh, Ms. Jessica Adams. Uh, she's the Executive Director for Alexandria, Arlington, and supports the District of Columbia uh, with the American Red Cross in the National Capital Region. And we have um, Matthew Little, uh, who is the Deputy Director, Individual and Community Preparedness Division with U.S. Department of uh, FEMA. So uh, please, or guests, if you would like to uh, come up to the, to the table. Mm -hmm. So we have with us a, a panel of subject matter experts that are going to talk to us about the things that we should be doing to be prepared in case of a disaster. And remember, uh, we're not only talking about natural disasters, we're also talking about man-made disasters. As you know, we went through 9-11 uh, in the year 2000, and we all experienced the vicissitudes of working with uh, New York City and the state of New York and, and New Jersey in the recovery of 9-11. So I'll turn it over to you, and Madam, I'll give you uh, the first uh, chance at it. So <laughs> please let us know who you are, 
and take it away. Sure. Uh, good morning. My name is Jessica Adams. I am a local uh, Red Cross representative. I am the executive director for Alexandria Arlington, and I also support the District of Columbia. Uh, I've been with the Red Cross for about 16 years, including a year and a half of volunteer time. And over that time, I have supported, I, I started as a disaster volunteer in DC, and then I came on to disaster staff and was doing local responses. And Hurricane Isabel in 2003, if anybody was around, uh, was sort of where I cut my teeth locally on a larger response. And then I managed our volunteer services for a number of years before stepping into the executive director role in 2012. And while I have not prepared opening remarks, um, I am looking forward to talking to you about preparedness overall and hopefully answering some of your questions. Thank you. Great. Um, my name is Matt Little. I work for FEMA just down the road here. Neighbors, thanks for the food court that's just next door. We appreciate coming over here and using it. Uh, and um, I work in the Individual and Community Preparedness Division. So FEMA's been in the news a lot lately for its response and recovery activities for sure. But there's a whole part of the agency that's working with families, with individuals, with youth and children, with faith leaders and elected officials to help them get prepared before the disaster ever hits. And um, that's what I focus on. Some of you may have heard of the CERT program, Community Emergency Response Team program. That's one that, that we have. We have some great youth preparedness resources from our Youth Preparedness Council, which is a group of high schoolers that work in their communities and nationally to encourage youth to, to take steps to prepare. And then we do some other things like a, a great program called You Are the Help Until Help Arrives, which teaches anybody five simple steps that they can take to save a life and hopefully be the first link in the chain of survival during a disaster or an emergency or, or some other event. So that's what we do. And, and just like was mentioned, we're very happy to discuss some ideas with you about how to get prepared at home or in the workplace or within your community and certainly open for questions as well. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Yeah. I'm Suzanne Isaacs, and I'm with the Office of Housing Counseling, and I have a little bit more to say. <laughs> uh, and first, I want to take a moment to thank Dr. Carson and the current administration for their incredible support of disaster recovery and response. It's been uh, a phenomenal experience working with this new group, and we find that things are really happening in a very positive way for people across the United States. And what I've learned on myself uh, involved in this DART disaster assistance response team is very few of us are prepared for a disaster, including myself. And I'm on the team. And it's not just disasters, it's emergencies that can happen. And if you look across the country, so many individuals have been involved in fires, tornadoes, hurricanes, uh, and there's emergencies like medical bills, flat tires, uh, daily life things happen. Uh, in the past few months, I was going on HUD travel. I was doing my, something said, go downstairs and just do a quick sweep. And uh, I was getting ready to leave to the airport and there is my water heater uh, all over the floor, <laughs> the water. And I was in an emergency situation and I was trying not to make it into a disaster. And I was not prepared for something as basic as that. Um, the house was newer to me. Who do I call? I got to get to the airport. What happens if I can't make it? And so on a very basic level in my own home, I found I was not prepared. And I am really appreciative to my brother uh, who came and took over. But that's, that's where we start. Uh, we really need to start at the home front and getting ourselves prepared. Now, since 2004, uh, FEMA and Operation Hope, uh, Operating Hope has been collaborating to build financial preparedness. That's what I'm going to talk on for a few minutes. And uh, FEMA has developed an emergency financial first aid kit that you can go online and find, as well as going to ready.gov, R-E-A-D-Y.gov, which is what Dr. Carson was recommending that you do. And the nice thing about the ready.gov and this other kit is that there's actually uh, forms you can go to and do checkoff sheets. And that's really important uh, so that you don't miss anything. So how do you do this? Where do you start in this overwhelming project? 
And when you look at people like after Hurricane Michael, in a flash overnight, they, they woke up the next day to nothing. So first thing you do is you do take inventory of your important documents. So what is that? Uh, that would be any lease agreements that you have, your monthly mortgage, uh, your mortgage papers that you have, and you can print and download any other obligations that you have if you are a paper-driven person. Uh, and how do you safeguard those papers? You take them to a safe deposit box. You put them in a fireproof and waterproof, not just fireproof, but we're looking at waterproof uh, safe these days. And uh, you, you put those important documents there. If you do put it in a bank deposit box, well, what happens, uh, God forbid, if you are someone who's come into harm's way during the event, who can have access to that deposit box? Something we don't always think about, it. we assume. Uh, so if, let's say if you have a, if you're married or have a significant other, you both are washed away or you're in the hospital and you can't speak, who can get to those papers and your power of attorney for you? So keeping that in mind. And it's also important to check the state laws, who can be in the line of access uh, when you're not available. And like Dr. Carson also mentioned, it's really important to take a photo journal of what you have uh, from your paintings to your furniture to your jewelry. Believe me, she's going to talk about insurance. When push comes a shove, you're going to have to be able to prove that you've got that diamond ring or you have that $20,000 painting hanging on your wall. And for those who, who were in harm's way with uh, Hurricane Michael and the other storms, if they didn't do that, they're just out of luck. So the iPhone or a smart device is a really good way to take that uh, photo journal of what you have available. Uh, also, when you're storing your documents, of course, we work at HUD. We're aware we need to pass uh, word proof everything. Uh, and it's also recommended in case your iPhone would get lost, you got everything in there, have it on an a external hard drive and have everything encrypted. And if you don't know how to encrypt it, uh, go online and Google it and learn. It's also important to download any banking or bill information that you have into your smart device or some other format that you pay online. And of course, it's always good to know your FICO score, but because if you've lost everything, uh, you say, well, why do I need to know my FICO score? You need to be able to sit across from the table and from somebody and say, I am eligible right this minute to get an emergency loan. And so it's important to have that awareness as well. And so why are you doing all of this? So I can just pull it all together for you. It's because when you wake up and the next day and you have nothing, these documents, this financial information is outside of your health is number one. Uh, you're going to have to contact your mortgage servicer. Your bill's still going to come due. Uh, many banks will allow you to have a 90-day forbearance, but if you don't call, you're going to pay. Uh, you need to come in contact with your credit card companies. Call them one by one and say, whoops, you know, I, I'm, I'm involved in this disaster so that they will put your payments on hold or make a note to your file so that while you're in the disaster, your credit score is not trashed. Uh, and you need to contact your utility companies. Your electric bill still due, your plumbing bill, your water bill still due, all that still due even though you're looking at a concrete pad. So you need to stop those as well. And um, the next thing you would do is contact your insurance company. Wouldn't you, Colleen? <laughs> <laughs> That's my throat. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm Colleen Weiser. I work with Suzanne in the Office of Housing Counseling. Uh, very excited that the Office of Housing Counseling was established November 2012, and we were barely had our feet wet and got. To, we are we're, we are a virtual office also that we barely had a chance to know who our colleagues were when Hurricane Sandy for, uh, struck in 2013. And I was involved in um, organizing our office's response 
to Hurricane uh, Sandy, which involved preparing a document that helped our HUD-approved housing counseling agencies be able to present the benefits that HUD-approved housing counseling agency has to state and local communities so they could, as the states were awarded CDBG disaster relief funds, that hopefully the state would trickle some of that money down to the HUD approved housing counseling agencies. So Suzanne said, you know, uh, insurance plays a very large part in being prepared for a disaster. So one of the things you need to do is assess your insurance coverage. Don't, uh, it shouldn't be something <laughs> you're assessing once the disaster happens. You need to be proactive. Uh, you're all aware when you get a mortgage or even if you're renting, you get homeowner or hazard insurance or you get a renter's insurance policy. And what those covers uh, are damage to your home and your possessions, some of the possessions, not your $20,000 paintings or, or diamond rings, that's a separate rider. Uh, Liability, if somebody is injured to your property, which also can happen during a disaster. And living expenses, if you need to relocate while your home is repaired, that's very important uh, to understand. Uh, recently, we all can relate to the amount of rain our metro area has experienced, uh, the summer of rain. So one of the places that comes to mind, Ellicott City, flood insurance is very important. Make sure that you know whether or not you're living in a flood insurance um, plane and uh, uh, know that homeowner's insurance does not cover flood uh, damage. Um, so the other thing is people outside of a floodplain, you can check with your insurance carrier. Your insurance carrier may offer flood insurance even if you're not in a floodplain. I don't live in a floodplain. I'm in an elevated, but yet because of the amount of rain we experienced this year, my bricks got wet and, and I had moisture in my basement and they had to come and they had to uh, put a special coating on, on the bricks. So even if you think you're not in a flood insurance, you can experience damage due, due to rain, and that wasn't covered by flood insurance, but uh, still it was something I had, had to deal with, one of those emergencies, maybe not disasters. Uh, renter's insurance, it does cover your possessions, liability if someone is injured on your property, and again, living expenses if you need to relocate. Uh, Annually, maybe sooner, you need to review your, insur your homeowner's insurance policy. Uh, a lot of people, it wasn't that long ago, maybe 10 years ago, we were in a recession and real estate values plummeted in this area. Uh, now we have appreciation has, has, has come back. Is your current insurance policy, does it cover the current value of your property? Have you kept up? with what your property is worth. Uh, the other thing, don't be underinsured. Uh, to save money and out-of-pocket costs, uh, those arise when you have inadequate insurance coverage. Uh, you should always be wary of low premium cost with huge deductibles. Don't look for a bargain. Try to go with a well-known name of an insurance company. Uh, regarding flood insurance, if that uh, applies to you, you need to understand what flood insurance is involved. Uh, there's a summary of coverage, which is, uh, was prepared by the NFIP to help you understand your flood insurance policy. Uh, there is a, uh, the policy, the policies, policyholders help with or without disaster declaration page. Explain, explains what a flood insurance policy, policy holder should do if there is a presidential disaster declaration. Uh, our office, or the DART team, does follow, and we've learned the difference between presidentially declared disasters, declared disasters, emerge. You have to understand the presidentially, presidentially declared disasters are those areas which are going to receive <coughs> federal assistance. Uh, and 
for, for what we do in our office, we have prepared toolkits for our HUD approved housing counseling agencies uh, to use. We're trying to leverage uh, housing counseling agencies to be available to borrowers or even renters who have experienced disasters so they can help them uh, with either a new budget, financial assistance, a lot of them help them fill out. They're overwhelmed. They're in a stressful situation. They're in shock. They've never had to f deal with the amount of paperwork that comes with filling out a small business administration loan or dealing with insurance companies. Uh, they've been on the line waiting and getting busy signals. They don't know what to do or they've sent in their paperwork and their paperwork get lost. They need somebody who is trained to work with people in stressful situations that can guide them and be the rational uh, mind that can devise a plan for them. So if you'll, after this event, if you'll take the time to come over to the, the adjoining room, you can look at our table. We have posters that we've prepared for our housing counseling agencies. We actually have job aids for our uh, HUD approved housing counseling agencies that walks them through. Here are the items, you know, your client comes in and maybe they need uh, information regarding flood insurance, how to walk them through. And I have a new guest sitting next to me. Yes, yeah, so we have with us, uh, we have the honor of being joined by Mr. Robert Branham. Mr. Robert Branham works with the District of Columbia Homeland Security Office, and he's an expert on disaster. So, Mr. Branham, thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you, and I appreciate uh, your high level of confidence in declaring me an expert. Um, what I uh, want to do is piggyback and uh, on what has already been discussed, and my federal partner from, uh, from FEMA, um, but we concentrate uh, primarily on those disasters that are local to the District of Columbia that encompass not only the weather-related ones and, and terrorism, but also that may come about uh, like power outages, uh, fire, and I want to piggyback on something Susan said about having your documents uh, a recent uh, incident that shows the importance of those of those documents, and sometimes even having those documents someplace other than your own home, it was when they had the that massive tragic fire at the Arthur Capper Senior Center. Uh, those residents lost everything, even their documents. So uh, recreating those documents was a was an experience, and uh, the district government was able to recreate some of the documents, some of the benefit documents that they needed, driver's license, uh, birth certificates, and things, that, things like that. It was easy if you were born in the District of Columbia. And they could, make, they could waive some things so that you can get your birth certificates. But if you were born outside of the District of Columbia, that was an entirely morass that those seniors had to go through in order to recreate some of the other documents, like passports, you know, VA benefits, um, documents. And some of them were veterans, and they had they lost everything: the veterans' records, documents, uh, medals, insurance papers. And a lot of them were seniors, and they didn't have banks; they kept their cash at home. So uh, it, it, it was very traumatic for them. And uh, the, the couple of days that I was there with them, uh, they needed. Uh, the service of counseling, um, you know, they need they they needed socks, <laughs> you know, they were, you know, it, it was very traumatic, and fortunately, because they did have family here in the area, they were able to uh, reach out and get some of that get and maintain their family support, their church support, their community support, but it was still a very traumatic experience when you're trying to recreate your life in documents that you had lost completely. Um, and uh, so we try, when we go out and tell everyone to be prepared for whatever disasters, we also tell them that you need to have contacts and have those documents sometimes secured someplace other, uh, a family member's home. 
because if you lose everything at one time, trying to recreate that, and particularly if you're seeing, you can, you can forget the documents that you have lost. You know, you can, you know, your medical records, your prescription, you know, uh, it was, it was, we were going out trying to get uh, uh, canes, dentures, eyeglasses, you know, so, uh, but uh, uh, they're being taken care of. Uh, but that's just one example. And similar to FEMA, we have our own CERV DC and CERT program where we train individuals to be part of a community breath of uh, first responders to assist uh, the police and fire if there is an emergency and if there is uh, other events. Uh, uh, we have a little caveat with our CERT program because when we have major events, our CERT personnel get trained to assist for inaugurations, parades, protests, assistant traffic, traffic uh, control, as well as if a building collapses, if there is a major major event. So, and, uh, so that's how the District of Columbia seeks to protect uh, its residents. And we also go out to federal agencies we do this uh, emergency preparedness uh, training oddly. We do it at the Supreme Court. We go on Capitol Hill. So we, we go everywhere there are people within the District of Columbia embassies to get them because they want to know as individuals how to stay prepared, how to uh, uh, stay prepared, and not only for themselves, but they also have to come up with uh, preparedness kits for their own family members. My emergency kit will be different for my son, you know. So, uh, and, and you need to be sure that you have those items that would that they will be safe with and feel comfortable with for 72 hours. And we even have kits for, for pets. So that when they go and they have to move, relocate, they won't hesitate because they can't take their pet with them. And one of the things that we try to do is make it as comfortable for people in a very traumatic experience that they un that they're undergoing and we're out we have a table out with some materials that uh, you can pick up uh, uh, after the, uh, we've finished here finished here thank you right thank you so any questions for mr Branham before we move on and feel free to ask any questions as um, you know um, as we proceed ma'am uh, we can't hear you. Could you please go up to the microphone? Uh, a few testing one two yeah. Uh, a few uh, of the uh, apartment fire residents there. Um, a few of them went to my church, and I'm wondering. I, I really appreciate the whole panel, but I could really appreciate what you guys are doing with the elderly, and I was wondering if you go out to different forums to talk to people about just what I you do. did. I do. I have. I've gone to various uh, senior centers, mm -hmm. uh, and, they've, and they've had some very uh, specific questions. And my response is that the apartment complex or the senior center management is responsible for conducting the necessary drills that they need in order to, to test the system. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a critical piece. Right. testing this for everyone got out no right. loss of life right but the alarms didn't go off the smoke detectors didn't go off the sprinklers didn't work and that was the, and, and they still don't know why that happened and but it's a matter of testing the system on a uh, regular uh, on, on a regular basis and uh, so that's what uh, uh, that's that's the thing we have to we have to encourage the management company that they need to test the system. And sometimes it doesn't have to mean evacuating the building, just test the system. But our fire alarm didn't even go off. I'm the wondering. The went in, with the, with the uh, soldiers from the barracks went over there right. to assist. They pulled the uh, alarm, the alarm didn't go off. That's, that, is, that is true. Uh, but I'm wondering if you, as uh, I don't know if you're part of the housing counseling or, or your agency, but 
uh, whoever you work for, will you be able to go out and talk with um, uh, different groups? I mean, I'm, we a, do. I'm part of a different we do. groups. We do. We okay. do it on, we do it on so a So I can see you at the table and talk to you about that. Yeah, we that. do it on a regular basis. <laughs> okay. We go to churches. We go to schools. That's what I'm asking, We go yes. out into civic association meetings. Okay. We go, we, uh, we're very proactive in going out into the community to the right. community to, uh, to do that. In fact, we even go out with MPD and do active shooter training. Wow. You know, so that uh, yeah. for, for businesses. Okay. For, for businesses. Well, I think you just being recruited, sir. Right. So thank <laughs> you. I'm going to hold you to that. Do, do, you mind if I, do you mind if I add to that a little bit? Sure. So um, you'll find that most emergency management groups are out there doing engagements on a regular basis, but um, we've, we can't be the only ones talking about this stuff. and. Even though I work for FEMA, this is going to sound a little strange, but we've got to move disasters out of the preparedness realm. It's not preparing for disasters because most Americans see that and they think it's somewhere off in the future. It may never even come, so why should I do it today? But everything that's been talked about here from protecting your documents, from calling your insurer, from getting training in the workplace or doing a fire drill at home, those all reap rewards today for other parts of life, right? So hearing that there are seniors who aren't banking and that they lose their life savings in a fire because they have that cash at home, the problem there isn't the fire. The problem there is that they haven't had access to banking in a way that seemed accessible, right? It, w it was too intimidating to go to the bank on the corner or they weren't sure how or they didn't understand the forms or something like that. So we've got to figure out a way to take some of these tips that have been shared, whether it's insurance related or or saving documents or starting an emergency savings fund or whatever it is, and, and we got to find a way to do that today. I, you know, we, we actually, um, HUD uh, Housing Counseling has been an incredible partner of ours, and, and I thank you for that. We've woken up to this idea that every April, which is Financial Capability Month, has to be the time when we're pushing this preparedness message, even more than perhaps Disaster Preparedness Month, Emergency Preparedness Month in September. That's the month when we have to do it. You know, low-income kids in America many times interact with 16 different federal offices or agencies on a monthly basis, and not a single one of them is an emergency manager. So we've got to train up our partners, whether it's through HUD or some of our other federal partners, to be confident in this message so they can share it and have that intervention face-to-face -face with the people that we're trying to reach, because that's how we're going to change this. Um, coming from emergency managers, we may have the credibility or the experience of the war story to really drive it home, but we've got to make sure that we move it into the day-to-day -day life so that people have a chance to, to make a difference today, whether or not the disaster ever comes. Thanks. Excellent point. Uh, any questions for Mr. Little? Yes, ma'am. Well, I, actually, I had uh, questions for the housing counseling. Um, now, are the, is the disaster services given to people with FHA mortgage insurance or rental vouchers or to the general public? Anybody. Uh, what happens is we've got over 1,800 housing counseling agencies in, in the United States, and housing counselors are now uh, trained on disaster preparedness and recovery. And so during an event, uh, or a after an event or pre-event, you can sit down with a housing counselor and go through these documents that we're speaking of. It can, you can be sex section eight, you can be homeless, uh, you can be uh, a homeowner, or you can you know, just be a wannabe, I, I wish I had a home. <laughs> <laughs> and they'll help prepare you, help you with your forms if it's post-disaster, help in filing all of that information. If they don't have the skill set, then they will refer you to an expert in that particular field. Now, now see, it wouldn't have occurred to me to go to housing counseling, first of all, in the case of a disaster, because that's like for first-time home buyers, I think, right. to find out how to get it together to buy a house, okay? or maybe possibly somebody that's already getting some sort of rental subsidy. It would not occur to me, because I don't get any kind of HUD-related benefit, to go to a HUD housing counseling agency to get assistance with housing stuff in the case of a disaster. Sure, and thanks to the new administration, uh, that's 
changed this past year. Uh, they're now uh, in bidding in uh, uh, some of the uh, federal funds that uh, the agencies on a local level are highly encouraged or they are required to work with a housing counseling agency in the area uh, and direct people in that, you know, towards them. Because the housing counselors have been living in a particular community for years. That's, that's their home base. They're already connected. And so those are the people who are more empowered and that you trust uh, to really work with you on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And our so we're changing that perception right now. Our experience has been that um, under the leadership of Secretary Carson, for instance, when we have a mission assignment from FEMA and we open the disaster recovery centers, that's where the folks who have been impacted by a disaster go to. Under this administration, we started a pilot of having the housing counseling agencies on site. Um, we did that in Puerto Rico, we did that in the U.S. Virgin Islands, and the feedback, as Mr. Little indicated, was totally positive. I mean, folks that had lost everything and they had no idea how to proceed, uh, the housing counseling agencies were able to refer them to housing, were able to do a number of referrals um, for interim assistance that had never been done before. So I think we're really getting um, some traction in putting housing counseling in those disaster recovery centers, and we will be seeing more of that. Um, if I can uh, add to, uh, to this, um, uh, it's good that we concentrate on the homeowners and those that um, uh, uh, in a, they have a place to, place to stay. But under this, uh, the local administration, Mayor Muriel Bowser and the director, Chris Rodriguez, we have an emphasis on the homeless, those who don't have stable homes, because in a disaster, they suffer also, you know, in inclement weather, mm -hmm. you know, in the winter. Uh, so we have an active program that when the, when the situations come, uh, we have to take care, take care of them also, and also the special needs population uh, that, 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 get, that can fall through, uh, through the cracks because uh, so many people don't think that they exist, you know, so uh, through no fault of their own. And so uh, we, the mayor and the director, remind us that uh, we have to think more broadly about how we re uh, reach out into the community to reach those that don't have a, a place and uh, their records are with them. They take their records with them every day. You know, mm -hmm. in the, on the, their, their shopping carts and whatever, under the bridges, we go with where they are because they need help too. I was okay. going to say, uh, to your point, that it never occurred to you that you could use a housing counseling agency uh, for the purpose of uh, reviewing your documents or making a plan. Our DAS is very aware of that, and we're currently exploring rebranding. Uh, one thing. Uh, housing counseling during the recession. Everybody go to a housing counselor if you're to get uh, pre-foreclosure counseling. Or like mm -hmm. you said, on the other side now, if you want to buy a house, go see a housing counselor. So we are working on changing uh, the perception because really uh, housing counseling agencies navigate you through the whole home ownership, anything that would occur while being a homeowner, uh, what happens post home ownership or being a rental. So, so we are working on a rebranding effort. I just wanted to mention that. Okay. And we have a table in the next room and it's full of all kinds of different flyers uh, that housing counselors are starting to use uh, pre and post disaster. So feel free to grab a bunch of them. I think you need to take a look at um, your visibility on www.hud.gov. Um, I haven't looked at the new uh, layout in detail. It used to have for lenders, for homeowners, for this, for that, but it never had a for citizens. And maybe there needs to be a tab up there for disasters or something, you know, because if I'm in trouble, you know, I want to get to something fast. And unfortunately, the way we think of our business is not the way uh, people of the general communities think of, 
you know, they're just looking for help. And I don't know, a lot of the verbiage that's on our main pages won't really make a whole lot of sense to them. I can talk to you later about no, that. Excellent point. And we'll, we'll look at, at our site and see whether we can be Here. more uh, proactive. So, uh, Ms. Adams, um, you will. So, another question? Yep. Okay. Oh, hi. I just had a question. Um, I came in a little late, so I don't know what the start of the conversation was. But um, to me, it seems like um, uh, uh, planning ahead and getting the message out. Has the federal government and the local government considered an ad campaign? Because um, a lot of your elderly people, uh, in particular, uh, maybe disabled people, or people in general, watch the news, they watch TV, and if these ads could come out to tell people how to be prepared in the event that a disaster were to come up, you know, all these disasters, we're continuing to have different types of disasters. They're coming every year. They're coming three and four times a year. It just seems like there ought to be something in people's face to say, this is how you prepare. This is who you contact. This is what you should do. And I don't see that anywhere. You don't hear anything from anyone until a disaster is on its way, and then you might get bits and pieces to say, are you prepared, did you do this, or we're going to get you help. But to me, prevention is, you know, goes a long way. And I just think it seems to me that this should be something that is ongoing um, on a, a daily basis that people should be informed on how to get help and how to be prepared. If I may respond, I agree with you wholeheartedly. And uh, part of our effort is from the local government is we do put uh, ads, we've done it on the buses, we put it in, in, in the subway. We are uh, uh, enhancing our, our social media outreach. Uh, we uh, have uh, the director goes out regularly and does uh, uh, interviews with local media to push, uh, to, to push it out. But uh, a lot of this, this, this ad promotion costs money. <laughs> and, and, you know, and uh, uh, it's, uh, it, that has an impact. But we do agree, but I, we do agree with you, and we do go out to, and uh, promote uh, in, the public, in the public area where, where we can. But one of the best things is, is, that, we're, is that word of mouth when, when people see an American Red Cross, uh, they have a massive uh, public ad campaign that uh, touches on uh, di uh, disasters, and they partner with us every time there is an issue here in the district. Just they show up when we show up. <laughs> so we're going to would, turn it over then to Ms. Adams. Ms. Adams, the Red Cross is what we call one of the first responders. Uh, you make us all proud every time we see a disaster and we see the Red Cross there. Um, we know that we're on the right track. Um, we have events where uh, folks are encouraged to evacuate. We've seen a lot of that uh, lately where governors and, uh, and county judges say, you know, you must evacuate. Uh, there's other circumstances where it's shelter in place, uh, where the advice is stay put. Uh, you'll be better off than trying to get on I-95 and get stuck in the middle of the highway. So what's your uh, advice uh, as it comes to preparedness uh, from the Red Cross perspective? Thank you. Um, so from a Red Cross perspective, I would talk to you about an all hazards approach and having that kit and that plan and practicing it and communicating it. I cannot stress that enough. If you are the only person in your family that knows your emergency plan, you have failed. So you need to have that plan for you, for children in your household, for relatives, you know, if there are seniors in your life that you're caring for, for your pet certainly, all of those folks need, need a plan. And then as far as kits are concerned, one of the things that we talk about, and this is shocking to most, is we want you to have a kit in your home, in your vehicle if you have one, and then in your place of employment. And we need you to have those kits that can sustain you and anybody else that needs to for three days. And that, that, that's hard for a lot of folks. And that's just your evacuation kit. Because then we also want you to have that kit. So like you mentioned, if you have to shelter in place, if you're not evacuating, we need you to have that kit ready to, to go and sustain yourself for up to two weeks. Because we just know help might not be there right away, the situation might be dangerous, whatever it might be. 
And so there are a lot of things. Does everybody here have a kit? This is like the quiz portion. Who has a kit at home? Okay, we are like woefully underprepared here. <laughs> so I really want to see everybody in the next room coming by and talking about having their kits. Um, I would also add um, um, plans for businesses. If you have a side business, if you are part of a church uh, congregation, we also have other tools. So um, readyrating.org and there are other programs. FEMA has a great program. Um, visit ready.gov. Ready Rating is designed for schools, for businesses, uh, for faith-based organizations. You can go on there. It is completely confidential, but you're able to rate yourselves and see where you need to improve because we want to make sure that everybody can, can continue long after that disaster passes and that those congregations are still able to meet um, whether you have a building or maybe don't have a building or whatever the change may might might have brought um, to your lives. I also want to mention our mobile apps. Um, like many, we have a ton of free mobile apps available. Um, a great one is our first aid app because along with being prepared and having that plan, we also want you to know how to save a life. We want you to have that first aid and that CPR training know where there is an AED, know how to use it. If you're in a federal facility, I have to imagine there's one around here. I didn't see it as I walked in, and I try to always find them so I can, can quiz folks and point them out. Um, but I'm sure, I'm sure you do. Um, but does everybody know how to use it? So we actually, our HR person has um, twice now had to perform CPR and life-saving measures for colleagues. We love her. We want her around. But like, who here knows how to save a life? Hey, but we've got to, okay. More, more folks know how to save a life in here than have a kit, so I feel pretty good about that. <laughs> um, but the other mobile app I want to mention is our emergency app. That is great. If you go on to the App Store and just search Red Cross, you're going to find all of these. But the emergency app actually will also show you every single open emergency shelter across the country. So whether it is here or if you're traveling, you can see every, if you're impacted by disaster, you can find all the shelters that are open. It'll give you the address, it'll give you directions, but we want you to know at all times, no matter if you are home or traveling, where you can go to find a safe place to stay, where you can find meals um, and additional assistance. So there's a lot to consider. I know it can be daunting, and so I do encourage you to just sort of bite off pieces as you can do it with your families, make it fun. Um, some of the other programs we have um, for youth, so if you have um, a connection to a school, especially elementary schools, our Pillowcase Project. That is designed to teach children grades uh, three through five how to get prepared, how to have that kit. Really hands-on, interactive, and then the hope is they get prepared, they go into the home, and they continue to prepare people in their households and beyond because we know kids will go home and they'll just, they'll just drive at home. Um, so there are a lot, of, a lot of options there. And as you know, there's a, a lot of low-tech stuff that we can do to be prepared. Um, I noticed that in the U.S. Virgin Islands and in Puerto Rico, people had their bathtubs full of water. Uh, they had their washing machines full of water. Um, I saw people had uh, battery radios, um, they had flashlights, things that we don't think of uh, that are very basic, but when the lights goes off, I mean, remember in the U.S. Virgin Island, uh, there was no uh, telephone. Uh, all the cell towers went down, the same thing in Puerto Rico. So if you thought you were cool because you had your iPhone, well, bad news, there was no service. And this went on for a month at a time. So again, basic things like water, uh, basic things like uh, uh, light in your home, it makes a big difference. You know, right now, uh, one thing that we're doing uh, uh, on the islands is we're taking advantage of the sun. Uh, we're getting uh, uh, sun lamps. So during the day, these things are charging, and at night, you have, a, you have at least you have light. Um, and it's amazing uh, the vicissitudes that you go through when the lights goes off and when there's no water. We take these things for granted, uh, but they're essential, and there's many low-tech things that we can do. Yeah, I'd also like to add, um, 
you, you mentioned water and those basics and those, those hand crank radios, uh, but the other important things are to make sure, and we've talked a lot about the documents and saving documents, but also to supplement those kits with extra eyeglasses, hearing devices, medications. Um, talk to your pharmacies, get extra, because I hear from a lot of folks that are like, I'm just going to go through my house and I'm going to grab everything and I'm just going to put it in a bag. You will not. You just won't. You're going to forget it. And these are things that you are going to need, and they're going to be hard to replace, especially in those, those first 72 hours or so. Um, so make sure that you take those steps for yourself to have anything in those kits that is going to make your life more livable. So Jessica is totally right. And she and I, we've been interacting, what, now, like uh, six, seven years, eight years yeah. on this yeah. kind of stuff. And I think that it's so important that we think about um, how we make it relevant to folks who are just getting started on this journey, because it can be overwhelming, right? And so we want to look at the things that are going to be the simple stuff to get people started. The, the, mo the number one motivating factor for people to get prepared, unfortunately, is experience in a previous disaster. So we've got to work on that, right? Because we've got to find other ways to get them um, thinking about it without having to go through the hardship. And the second most important thing to getting people to actually take a preparedness action is that they believe the action that they take is gonna make a difference in their safety and the safety of their family. So that's really telling because a lot of people don't think that what they do will make a difference. And maybe it's because they feel overwhelmed by the amount of things that they're told to do or the amount of money they need to put aside or the time that needs to be spent on this stuff. So we really wanna start with the most simple activities to build that self-confidence in one's ability to stay safe. And that's why, as has been said by all, just a simple conversation around a dinner table is how we get this started. What would we do if I was at work and you were at school and I couldn't get home? That's the, that's the easiest way to start it. And it's the same for a faith community. You know, we're in the middle of a, of a Sunday service, the children are down in the religious education program, the parents are upstairs, and we hear police sirens around the corner. What are we gonna do, right? Those very simple questions help people get over that first hurdle of preparedness. They make it seem less scary, they make it seem less overwhelming, and after that, we start to build that self-confidence that goes from there. So. And, and all of you are obviously, you're, you're a part of this solution, right? It's not us up here, it's all of us, you're all, professionals that working with people having these day-to-day -day interventions, whether it's on the state level or the local level or with the individual or the family. So we need you to help us in this because it's with those simple conversations that we can really build this culture of preparedness in America. And one other item I'd like to add to that kit uh, that we've been skipping around is cash. Cash mm -hmm. rules. <laughs> and uh, the ATM is down, you can't go to yep. the grocery store and get an extra 20 bucks because that it does not exist anymore. And so what are you gonna do? The bank is, is closed as well. So make sure there's ample cash for you and your family to last for at least 10 days uh, because you can get things that you need with the cash. Without the cash, you're out. Yep. Excellent point. We experienced that um, in many hurricanes where uh, you can make it to the grocery store because they have a generator and when you give them the credit card, they said, uh, sorry, only cash, uh, the systems are all down. So, good advice. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Lottie. I don't really have a question, more so of a statement. And I was hoping to um, make a comment before the, um, the lady that was here um, in reference to promoting this, because we know September is National Preparedness Disaster Month, and that's been going on since 2004, so every year for the last, what's that, eight, 14 years, they, be, they have been promoting it. But we find that, as the panel has been really stressing, I find that um, oftentimes people are not gonna do anything until it's you know, a day before a disaster. And unfortunately, um, like with my family and my friends, I, you know, every September I send them the, you know, the email. I said, hey, at the FEMA, I love FEMA, the ready.gov. If you guys haven't went, and everything that's really been discussed, they have the toolkit, they have things that you could check off, everything is there, cash, what you need to do, the medicine, all that is already there. Um, we have local governments that promote it. So the promotion is there. It's not like, you know, the government or even nonprofits don't talk about it. Unfortunately, we don't pay attention or give heed to the warning until we are facing it. 
And so it is co um, contingent on all of us to, you know, when you leave here to really go and do something about it. And then my congregation, for example, every September, every September they go through it. Do you have your kit? You know, have, you know, go back in your kit. Is everything in there? Move out the outdated things. So I made sure my kit is right there by my um, door, one for my granddaughter. I have something in a car. But, you know, when you hear this warning beforehand, that's when, you know, to make sure you have everything instead of waiting to the last minute to, because yep. when, you, when you rush in and you panic, you're not going to think clear. You know, you're not going to go to ready.gov and go through that checklist. You got to do it right now. As it's been mentioned, it's not if a disaster is going to happen, it's unfortunately when. It could be anything from the small things to big, so we need to be prepared. I just, and the HUD has always promoted that. So if you guys are here and saying that you never heard of it, you're not going to the website. <laughs> you're not going, um, the, um, our internal website promotes it every year. Yep. Um, it gives you, tell you go to ready.gov. It sometimes is in the um, um, e-newsletter. So HUD has done a good job promoting it. Unfortunately, we you know, we have blinders on it sometimes. So I just wanted to give kudos to HUD. There's been blogs written on it. So we do our part here. It's just, um, fortunately, not everyone give heed yep. to the um, information. Yep, good so, point. Uh, remember, some, uh, some, uh, some disasters, you can do a little planning. Uh, you can see that the uh, depression just left Africa, and this thing might turn into a hurricane. And you know, and you can track it, and you see it coming your way. Uh, what happens when you get hit by an earthquake? There's no warning, there's nothing. Uh, what happens when there is a man-made disaster like 9-11? Uh, no warning, nothing. As Mr. Little mentioned, uh, you must be prepared uh, on a short-term notice. Uh, you will not have time to uh, get ready because it's there. Yes, ma'am. Good morning. Uh, thank you all for coming out. I'd just like to take the opportunity to piggyback on some of the comments that were made and one of the main issues for, with regard to kits, um, awareness, with regard to uh, children, uh, children and families having access into doing these things is poverty. This gentleman spoke about being homeless. A homeless person does not have access to the internet at all times. A homeless person does not have access to uh, television, social media, um, resources that would allow them to even walk around with a kit in their so-called carts or however they're housing their valuable possessions that's under a bridge or even a person who is on a fixed income or, or low income or even co-workers right here in this building who are living from paycheck to paycheck you know having cash some people, their rent take up their whole paycheck, so they don't have cash to just set to the side for something that's going to happen. I appeal to you as people in positions of opportunity to get a campaign kicked off. We, we hear all the time about coat fairs and let's bring this. You know, we've been doing this Fed Seeds family just recently. Well, why not let's get something together where we can prepare kits and give to families where well, we allot a certain amount of funds to be placed into these kits where, because guess what? The pharmacist is not going to give you extra medicine without a prescription. And the doctor is not gonna give you an extra prescription if you don't need it. They legally cannot. So with that said, if we put something in place, if we set some, some more regulations and statute and put funding, not just to prepare us to, to help us after the disaster, but to prepare more for the disaster by giving to those who need. Have your kits been done, miss? Have your, and you know, I remember back in the day, my grandmother said, oh, the insurance man would come to the house and knock on the door and sell you a vacuum cleaner. But before he sold you that vacuum cleaner, he brought that vacuum cleaner in and he gave you an example of how to clean that floor. And he showed you how it worked and everything and the salesman, and then, then he sold you that vacuum cleaner and you were prepared to clean your house. He left you with a tangible good that you would eventually need. And some of us today, we don't live without a vacuum cleaner, do we? Yeah. That's what we need to do for our people in this country and everywhere, especially those countries and those areas surrounded by 
water, wooded areas, and things like that. We need to target those people first. So again, my comment is to how we can help our citizens better is we have to give a little more. You know, we have to put out campaigns and stuff. Like he says, we put stuff on the buses and da da da. You have people that sit in their house all day. I have an aunt, she's 75 years old. Her entertainment is just like that lady said, the TV. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And whoever calls her on the phone, I can call her on the phone and tell her all day long, get this kit, da 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 da. I have to prepare that kit for her and take it to her. Great. Then I have to show her how to use it the best of her ability because she can't walk. Wonderful. We're going to consider your challenge. You know, the uh, veterans group uh, has done a, a project where they get backpacks for the kids that in, in impacted areas. Maybe we can talk to uh, Mr. Walter Elmore and Ms. Bishop and that group uh, and challenge them maybe to start a campaign in having uh, kids, uh, uh, preparedness kits for, uh, for, for our children. So I think uh, we're going to take a 10 minute break. I want to thank the panel for this wonderful. Okay, Miss. Um, we do give out kits, we, but we run out of kits every, every year. But we do give out kits for, for people and for, for, for pets. And I'm going to um, go into my emergency preparedness mode right now just to give you some information. Because I don't know where you are going to go when you leave here. But there was a current active shooter incident going on now on Silver Hill Road and Suitland, Maryland. I'm just, I don't know where your travels are going to take you. But I'm just laying that out. I just feel it's obligated to let you know that there is an active shooter situation going on now. And one person has been shot in that, in that area of uh, uh, Silver, Silver Hill Road and Silver Hill and Suitland, and Suitland. Excellent, thank you. Well, we want to thank the panel. Uh, this has been very informative. A big round of applause for the panel. <laughs> and we're going to take a 10-minute break, and then we'll have another panel that's going to talk to you about internal things that we do here at HUD and uh, the HUD perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, welcome back uh, to our preparedness symposium. Uh, we have the honor of having with us this uh, second uh, panel, Mr. Dana Bress. Mr. Dana Bress is a senior advisor and a subject matter expert on disaster. He is one of those guys that uh, works the magic formula to see what their main needs are and what is it that we need to do for stakeholders when a disaster hits? And we also have Mr. John Usury, who is emergency planning specialist in the Office of Disaster Management and National Security. They're going to talk to us about disaster preparedness and the things that we should do and the things that we shouldn't do. With no further ado, Mr. Bress. Thank you, Mr. Bergun. Yeah, the Jackpot. Okay, two basic rules. First rule, be prepared to protect your family and home. Second rule is if you live where a disaster strikes, be really prepared. But the problem is they, they pretty much strike about everywhere. This is predominantly targeting you and your home, not necessarily HUD. Why do, why do we care? You know, HUD plays a critical role in disaster response in the communities, and if your family is not taken care of, you can't do your job. So getting your fam keeping your family safe helps you be available to help the nation, to help the communities we serve in the nation. And you can protect your, your home through design, construction, and most specifically, insurance. Okay, I don't live in a place where disasters hit. Bull. Where do what are your disaster risks? Pretty much all of them. Uh, around DC, we get tornadoes, we get hurricanes, we occasionally get an earthquake, we get windstorms, we get rainstorms, we get snow. You know, as they said, you know, all the bad parts of the Bible. So regardless of where you live, the risks are there. You see here, a, this is a map of the presidential disaster declarations. And those are only the really big disasters. The little disasters, the power outages, the winter storms, the, 
those kind of things don't, you don't want to get a declaration. Declarations are really bad, you're really hurting, you don't want one. So all of the little things don't show up on this map. But the bottom line is if you look at the bottom uh, pie chart, you see fully 40% of the disasters are flooding. And flooding occurs everywhere. Uh, you see some of the white spots on that map. Those are places where there are more, more cows than people. Nobody lives there, because the way you get a disaster declaration is to have a certain level of per capita damage. So if you haven't got people, then there's not much damage. So uh, a little, we're going to blow through the risks. Flooding causes the most damage in America. Occurs everywhere. You saw the map earlier, way up in the upper Midwest, um, North Dakota, floods every year. And there's two kinds of flooding. There's riverine flooding. Think of that like the bathtub. The water comes up, gets everything wet, and then the water goes down. Then there's the coastal flooding, standing in the surf. The water has a lot of velocity and backs, you know, knocks the heck out of the houses. And that's what we, see, what we saw down in the Gulf Coast. Uh, rainfall. Right now, D.C. is about 20 inches ahead for the year. So we're getting, we got a lot of water, which causes runoff, which causes things to blow down when the winds come up because the soil is saturated, causes basements to leak. And flooding isn't covered by your homeowner's insurance policy. And it can cause thousands and thousands of dollars in uninsured risk, which pretty much is the wheels coming off the wagon as far as your financial plan. And it could destroy your home. You know, you see when people advertise high and dry, probably a good marketing technique, but you really don't want to buy a home that's high and dry. Uh, we worry about fires. America's gotten a pretty good handle on fires. About 3,500 people die each year in fires. But we worked the wildfires in California last year, and only about 50 people have died in wildfires. It's predominantly house fires, unattended, you know, all of the reasons that homes burn, unattended, you know, cigarette smoking, uh, you know, things just catching fire in the house. And there's about 360,000 home fires According to, uh, according to FEMA every year. Your preparedness there, smoke detectors, come up with an evacuation plan and rally points for your family. Make sure your family knows what to do when the smoke alarm goes off. Uh, everything's getting much better, but it still, it still presents a risk. Earthquakes. How many of us were there for the earthquake a few years ago in DC? Uh, I certainly know that the Washington Monument was there for the earthquake in DC. <laughs> Uh, it's not limited to the West. We generally think of earthquakes as the ring of fire around the Pacific. You know, uh, Japan, California. We also think about the Cascadia subduction zone in, uh, up in, in Washington State and the Wasatch Fault in, in, in Utah. But then you see there on the map, there's a big red blob at New Madrid, Missouri. And then um, Charleston, South Carolina got a big earthquake about a century ago, which means it's going to get another big earthquake at some point in the future. Earthquake, the failure, failure modes are buildings collapse, soil fails, and when, the, when all that crap, um, breaks up, things catch on fire. Tornadoes, well, we don't live in Tornado Alley. Yeah, sure. Um, they've occurred in all 48 of the continental United States states have gotten at least one tornado. Um, between 1950 and, 19, and 2007, the winner, if you want to call it that, was Vermont. They only got 36. The, the big winner was Texas. They got 7,500 tornadoes. And the reason for that, obviously, is Texas is much bigger, so it gets more tornadoes than Vermont, just based on size. But, but Texas and Oklahoma are in Tornado Alley. But we also get tornadoes here. We had tornado rip through La Plata uh, about 10 years ago, maybe 15 years ago. And the risks there include blowing stuff. The tornado winds are extremely high, and they, and, and they will blow a house over 
and that's why we favor tornado shelters in homes in, the, in tornado country. Um, we've been kind of tuned up of late about hurricanes. There the risk is both wind and flooding. If you happen, although the wind speed is much lower than a tornado, it lasts for a lot longer. A tornado will rip through, you know, from, from start to finish is 10 minutes. Hurricanes can last for hours and the buildings will come right apart. So the, what will happen is the winds will blow the buildings over and, and otherwise jeopardize the house and the people who are trying to shelter in that house. Evacuation is virtually always the best idea. Then we just have ordinary wind, the derecho in 2012 here, power outages. Uh, in many cases, these might not even qualify for, for a declaration. These could just be irritation. <clears throat> you could just be without power for three days while the power company comes back and tries to restore your power by replacing a whole bunch of wire. Um, and then at the, at the other end of the spectrum, we have terrorism and technological disasters. Whether that's uh, oil spills, whether that's terrorism, chemical spills, all of those things, pretty much the response and preparedness is not dissimilar to any other disaster. And because we live and work in the capital region, it's never far from our thoughts. And to their credit, uh, the DC government, FEMA, a whole, and a whole, num a whole lot of federal law enforcement, state and federal law enforcement agencies are spending a lot of time preparing for this. And here again, at the, at the family level, knowing what to do, knowing how to, how to respond with your family. So how do you respond to the risks? <clears throat> First, develop a plan. Talk to your family. Everything we heard both, both Dr. Carson say as well as the first panel. Get your emergency stuff. You know, stuff is good. Um, what do you need at home? With FEMA suggests three days of supplies. More is better. And you don't need to spend boatloads of money buying this zombie apocalypse, you know, freeze-dried everything. This is just ordinary food. You need to create a communications plan. How are you going to communicate? Your cell phone's not going to work. Consider evacuation, should you? And then you can improve your home to be more resistant. Plan on the power being out. Get your three days of supplies, your water, your food, your medications, and other supplies, your radio, so you can hear things. You're not going to have power. Um, a phone charger. After Hurricane Isabel, I was charging my phone in my pickup truck. Every time it would run out, would, we'd go outside and, and run the truck for a little bit and charge my phone, um, thus yielding f fuel for the car. So to, if you're going to stay at home, you need water, at least a gallon per, per person per day. How do I do it? I go to Costco or any of the other big box locations and buy those cases of water, and I rotate it. I don't generally like to drink water out of bo plastic bottles because it's in, well, plastic bottles. But, but by rotating it through, you can stock, you can keep the water in the basement and it's available and you don't have to worry about purifying it or anything else. It's, it's always there. Remember to rotate the stock. Drink the oldest stuff, store the newest stuff. If you, know there's, if you think there's gonna be a problem, think, not know, fill your bathtub and other containers with water because you can use that water to flush your toilets, uh, to wash, to, uh, to do other things, you know, because you're likely to want to be able to flush your toilets. And, and the water in the pipes should generally be, is generally safe. That's where the radio comes in. You can listen and find out if, they, if, it, if it remains safe. Because as long as the water's flowing, it's probably okay, and, but, but get the guidance. So what else do you need to stay? Uh, you need food. And there, like I said, there's no need to get that really expensive apocalypse stuff, uh, freeze-dried food, just Get the stuff, you know, have stuff in your pantry, canned food, you know, whatever it happens to be. Um, obviously, if you're not going to have power, eat the ice cream first. 
<laughs> you know, you know, so, so work, your way, work your way through the ice cream, then the other food in the fridge, and then go to the canned goods. And, and, but by keeping the canned goods in the pantry, you're rotating that food, that emergency food, by eating it. You know, you're using it. So it's not like you're storing, you know, you might, you, you might buy a, a few more cans of, of green beans or, or, or something like that, but, you're, but it, it's just in the, it's in the regular rotation. Uh, remember the pets? Either, you know, and a manual can opener. <laughs> you know, looking at that can of green beans and not being able to open it is not, gonna, is not a solution. What else do you need? First aid kit. <laughs> uh, as, as fancy a first aid kit as you want to get. You know, obviously what you want is, is, is some various salves and some bandages because if you're trying to open the cans without a can opener, you're probably going to cut yourself. Uh, medication. Uh, I keep, in my travel bag, I keep, you know, a handful of the, norm, of the medication I use. So when I travel, I don't have to harvest it out of the bathroom. Uh, so that could go into your kit. Uh, flashlight and batteries. It's likely to be dark. Flashlight, you know, whatever, whatever kind you're comfortable with, I use... What did I just do? <laughs> okay, I will continue as we do this. Um, the, um, what we saw next door, you know, matches. Your striker isn't gonna work on your electric, on your gas range when the power is out. The gas is still gonna be in the system, but, the, but the, your gas range won't work unless it strikes. So matches so you can light the burners. Uh, a radio and a cell phone charger. You know, they make little radios with cranks. So not only can you listen to the radio to get news, but you can also charge your cell phone. My wife has a, a little small solar panel that she uses to charge her cell phone. You just set it out on the patio. Uh, we heard cash. Cash is king. The ATMs won't be working or they're going to be empty. If everybody hits the ATM, it's going to get empty fast. And remember, fuel for the car. Um, we have communications plan. Your cell phones aren't going to work. You know, if, if we, those of us that were standing outside the building after the um, earthquake a few years ago, nobody could get a signal. Towers were still working, but everybody wanted to use them. Cell phones presume that most of us aren't making calls. So, but when you do get a chance, use text messages. Text messaging is a lot more reliable because you send it and it goes when it can as opposed to you standing there listening for a dial tone. Uh, relay messages throughout of area friends and family. You know, that way you're not trying to call your family. You can call somebody, Aunt Mary in Knoxville, and say, hi, this is Dana, I'm fine. And when other people call in, they can say, you know, heard from Dana, he's fine, and here is where he is. And have the key numbers written down. Here's my, uh, my wallet card. This is my phone number, my brother's phone number, all those things that are on my cell phone that I don't remember. And it serves also in case as an emergency thing in case I'm injured. Somebody can actually find my wife's phone number by rummaging through my wallet. How do you prepare? What else do you prepare? You, records. Uh, the vital records. Think about all the stuff in your wallet. Social security card, birth certificates, passports, marriage certificates, all of that stuff. The way I do it, a lot of that gets scanned. I have a couple of external hard drives, many external hard drives. And I keep one at the safety deposit box and I keep one at home. And then I swap them. So my entire desktop computer, including all my photos and all the things like the other stuff, is in my safety deposit box. So if I lose it, I might lose four months worth, as opposed to all of it. The other things you want, you, you heard about the, the photos of your household stuff, but what about the, the items of sentimental value? They might need to go in your go bag, you know, in a second go bag, so you could grab the stuff of, that you just can't, you know, you can't imagine living without. 
And how do you do this? Copy and store them off-site. I have certain records at my brother's house in Ohio. He has some of his records at my house. Um, you know, obviously, if you're talking about putting a box of records there, you, you know, there's, some, there's some faith that, that, of who you're storing them with. Um, scan and store them on, a web, on the web or in the, on a flash drive, a secure flash drive. Hard drives stored off-site. You know, hard drives have gotten really cheap, and that would be a great way to back up your computer, which you should probably back up your computer anyway, but that would be a great way to back up your computer somewhere else. And then also store some in a safe place at home. Evacuation plan. Should you evacuate? Many times, no. But you evacuate only when it makes sense and when, when it's advised by the community because the roads are going to be clogged. And then know where you're going to go. My wife goes to Ohio to my brother's house. I end up going somewhere else. <laughs> um, but, you know, but make sure that, that you know how to get there. Have a map, have the cue sheets, have the turns, and practice two or three different ways to do it because the Pennsylvania Turnpike is likely to be a little busy. And if you have to bail off, bailing off somewhere halfway between and not knowing how to get there because you don't have the maps and, you're, and you've, you've always learned to travel with your cell phone maps, it's going to be a little, uh, a little traumatic. And like I said, again, figure out how you're going to, you know, how you're going to carry the keepsakes. And when you're traveling, every opportunity you have to get gas, get gas. How do you prepare your house? There are a bunch of things you can do. HUD has a lot of them on, their, on, on the HUD user website, and FEMA has some as well, on how you can strengthen your house. You can make your house more disaster resilient. It's easy in new construction. Uh, the Habitat for Humanity houses always do well in hurricanes because they do a really good job of building them. You can retrofit your house. When you're, when you're putting your, a new roof on, great time to make the sure the sheathing is actually anchored to the house. You know, you see there an entire panel of sheathing in that upper right photo came right off with the shingles attached. The house suffered a great deal when that happened. Um, you can do a lot of these things at comparatively low cost. Strapping down your water heater, you know, strapping down other things so, so they don't fall over in an earthquake. And um, the many small failures, you know, windows that start to leak can leave a lot, you know, can open your house up to all kinds of moisture and water coming in. And, and that pretty much, you know, increases your costs dramatically. Uh, insurance, positively essential. Uh, your homeowner's insurance covers most risks. If you haven't read your homeowner's policy, please read your homeowner's policy. It's absolutely deathless prose. It tells you what's covered and what's not. Flooding isn't covered. Did I say that flooding wasn't a covered risk under your homeowner's insurance policy? Other things, it requires you play an active role in your house. My policy says constant or repeated seepage or leakage of water or steam over a period of weeks, months, or years. If my water heater craps out tonight, it's covered. If it craps out tonight and I don't notice it until next July, it's not covered. So, you know, do the walk around in your home and read your policy because you'll probably find you might want to have a conversation with your, uh, with your insurance company about how do I get this covered. Um, floods, not covered, but flood insurance is available. It's available not just to people in the special flood hazard area, but you can buy something called a preferred risk policy. They're generally about 300 bucks a year or so, and they provide a quarter million, dollar, a quarter million dollars of insurance against flooding. So if it fits into your plan, FEMA flood insurance is a great thing. And it, flood insurance is available for both renters as well as homeowners. And what's the ultimate benefit of this? Uh, either if you can't prevent the disaster, you can become resilient from it. 
And the resilient, being personally resilient means the community is more, is more resilient and the community recovers more quickly. And we don't see that kind of stuff 10 years after the disaster. We don't see empty stairs leading up to no house or those beat to heck mailboxes. Uh, one of the things that we, that that kind of resilience occurred at, in the Gulf after Katrina, folks with insurance were a third more likely to recover within a few years than folks without insurance. You know, I think we've all talked to families that, you know, that said, I've been, been out of my house for eight years. I couldn't imagine being out of my house for eight years. And for more information, ready.gov, great source. Flood insurance program, floodsmart.gov. The local emergency, Office of Emergency Management, whether it's DC, Arlington, Fairfax County, Prince George's County, those guys know what the risks are and can help you and can provide some coaching, as well as the local fire department. You know, because they're the they're those the fire department are the folks on the front line every time. Thank you. John? And we'll take questions afterwards. Thank you, uh, Dana, uh, for that uh, excellent uh, segue into our uh, next topic of uh, sheltering in place is what um, I'm going to talk to you about. Um, but first, uh, my name is John Usry. I'm from the Office of Disaster Management and National Security. I'm an emergency management specialist. Um, before I get started, I want to share with you um, an experience um, on a recent deployment to South Carolina in support of Hurricane uh, Florence. Um, I was fortunate enough to be part of the uh, initial uh, response uh, team uh, working down at the uh, initial operating facility uh, with the field Columbia, uh, Columbia South Carolina field office um, with uh, our, our team there, uh, uh, Tony Hebert, uh, Susan Passiani from uh, Massachusetts and the South Carolina uh, field office director team. Uh, we, we worked with the uh, FEMA uh, individual uh, assistance team and uh, our interagency partners. Um, and I just want to say that that experience helped to really, really um, give, give a, a, a depth of, of understanding of what it is to, to be a part of, of, of something great in dealing with um, survivors of, of disasters. Um, and that's what these individuals are when they go through something that's catastrophic. Um, they're disaster survivors. So um, to, to me, the, the experience of going through something um, like that is no different than being um, a, a victim of, of, of something tragic. I think the feeling of, uh, of, of disparity is just the same to, to wake up and lose everything that you have. Um, but to see uh, that HUD uh, shirt uh, and our uh, interagency partners and FEMA uh, gives, gives hope. And the work that we do at HUB in providing uh, housing uh, to our clients uh, and those that are in need um, help gave me a, a, a better understanding of, of the importance of the work that we do here at HUD. Okay. Um, we all at some point have uh, been caught in a rainstorm, I'm, I'm pretty sure. How many of you have umbrellas? Okay. So what I want to talk to you about is, is sheltering. Um, after being caught in that first rainstorm, we, we thought individual, as individuals, we ought to do something about it so that the next time that rain um, uh, occurred, uh, many of us probably uh, purchased an umbrella. Well, that umbrella gave us um, that sense or temporary shelter from that threat, from, from, from that rain, especially if you had your hair done, if you had that sport coat, 
or what have you, 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 you was not going to uh, have that happen again. So the individual uh, steps that you take to prepare for that next rainstorm was to go out and get that umbrella. So today I'm gonna to talk to you about sheltering uh, in place. Okay, so what is sheltering in place? So sheltering place means finding a, a safe uh, location indoors and staying there until you're given and all clear or told to evacuate. And you may be asked to shelter in place because of a number of things, a fire explosions, a severe weather event, the rain we just spoke of, hazardous materials relief, or even workplace um, violence or active shooter, which I'll talk about toward the end. So know that uh, sheltering in place warning is something that's gonna be issued by uh, public health officials or, or safety and security uh, professionals. Whenever there's a, a chemical or biological or radiological uh, contaminant that may be released either accidentally or intentionally uh, into the environments and uh, residents uh, in that community should select an area, a small room on the interior uh, with a few or no windows uh, to take refuge there. So choosing to uh, shelter is, is critical in times of disaster. So sheltering uh, is appropriate when conditions require um, that you seek protection in your home, whether it be your place of employment or other location when disaster strikes. Just to give some background, and I'll talk a little bit about evacuation and sheltering place options. So in 2017, we, we know that was a significant uh, year of the, of the disasters for, for many people. So in February 2017, uh, the flooding caused the Orville Dam in California uh, to fall, uh, causing evacuation of over 180,000 people. Uh, Hurricane Harvey that struck in Texas in 2017 um, resulted in evacuation of over 780,000 people. And then there was Hurricane Irma uh, uh, in struck Florida, which resulted in uh, evacuations of uh, a record 6.8 million. So some of the lessons learned uh, from these disasters have proven that evacuation and shelter uh, in place protective actions, they're gonna vary um, based on the threat or the hazard. So these protective actions uh, also vary on a community's uh, demographics, their infrastructure, uh, resources, authorities uh, and the decision-making uh, process. So consequently, uh, determining the most appropriate action uh, depends on a variety of, of factors. So sheltering place option, uh, understand it is a default option to the evacuation. So Dana Brez, you spoke of the, the many different um, disasters, whether it be flooding, hurricanes, uh, things of that nature. Um, but one of the things that we want to do to protect ourselves is either to evacuate that threat area or we're going to uh, do what's known as sheltering or stay in place. So regardless of the nature of that emergency, you may be asked to either uh, evacuate the area or shelter uh, in place. Going back to uh, earlier, uh, talk about the, the, the rain in the umbrella, uh, some of your individual uh, responsibility in, in being prepared for this thing. Um, so depending on your type of circumstance uh, and the type of emergency, uh, the first important decision is whether you're going to stay put or, or get away out of the areas. And you need to understand um, that you need to plan for both possibilities. Um, using uh, common sense and the most uh, available information uh, determine if there's an immediate danger uh, in any emergency. Uh, local authorities, they may or may not be able to immediately uh, be able uh, to provide you with information on what's happening and what you should do. Um, you want to use that information uh, uh, to assess the situation. And you can do so by using your telephones and television and radios and the internet is a, a, a good source um, for you as individuals to kind of be prepared and, and make the, the, the right decision as to whether you need to stay or shelter in place. So next, 
Uh, some things to consider when we're looking at your shelter and location. Um, to effectively shelter, you, you want to consider the hazard and then choose a place, in, whether it be in your home or other building, um, that is safe for that hazard. For example, if there's a tornado, a room uh, needs to be selected uh, in, a, in a basement or an interior room on the lowest level away from the corners, uh, windows or doors or outside wall. Um, so the safest location to seek shelter is going to vary uh, by the nature of that hazard. So some of the tips that you, you want to uh, ask yourself is uh, in, in the interior, whether it be a, a, a structure, you know, does the door lock, or does it open in or out? Is there furniture that you can use, depending on that threat, to, to barricade that door? You might want to also think about the, the food and water uh, and, and other medications that might be needed. Typically, sheltering is going to be for a short stay, but it could be uh, for an extended period. Yeah, we want to be prepared. Um, evacuations, they, they begin um, with spontaneous movements of evacuees uh, or, or the evacuation order uh, and may occur uh, pre or during or, or even after the, the incident. So similarly, a shelter in place can, can be the same. Um, uh, the, the duration or evacuation uh, or, or shelter in place is incident is uh, dependent and varies on the jurisdiction, the size, uh, location, and resources um, that are available. So one shelter, once the uh, shelter in place is, is called, um, the residents are expected to immediately go indoors. You want to bring your children uh, and your, your, your pets with you uh, and close and lock the windows. You want to lock the windows and doors because they're going to provide the, the, the best uh, airtight feel. Um, so all ways in which the outside material or contaminant that could enter the shelter needs to be eliminated, including uh, if your home has a fireplace, you want to make sure that you close the dampers and shutting off uh, any HVAC or ventilation system. So oftentimes a residence will be informed that a shelter in place order has been implemented through a number of means, whether it be the news, the emergency alert system, uh, the warning uh, sirens and horns, or reports from our uh, NOAA agency, uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, uh, weather reports, and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. When we typically shelter in place, it's going to be for a short beard, a period of time, typically no more than three hours. And the way we come about that number is based upon uh, uh, an occupant once breathing uh, producing uh, carbon um, dioxide um, in, in an airtight room, in which case anything beyond three hours in which the carbon dioxide levels will become dangerous. So the length of time that you're required to shelter in place may be short, uh, such as during this, uh, or tornado warning, or long, such as during a winter storm or a pandemic. So it's important that you stay in that shelter until local authorities uh, say is safe for you to leave. Um, additionally, you should turn uh, your, your radios uh, broadcast and maintain a 24-hour uh, safety watch during extended periods of sheltering. Uh, and you might want to manage your, your, your food, your water and your food supplies to ensure that you and your family have the required uh, quantities of supplies. Um, I'm just going to talk uh, just some basic general procedures that one could take during a shelter in place um, e event. Um, we will address our uh, sheltering in need, our sheltering plan for our facility here at headquarters um, at a later time. Um, I just want to keep it a little general for, for this setting. Um, but basically, if you're at home and a shelter in place order is given, we want to bring your family and pets inside. We want to lock the doors. Uh, we want to create that airtight uh, in, environment by closing windows, uh, fireplace damp, dampers, and turning off uh, all anything that can circulate air. We want to turn um, that system off. And we want to make sure that your emergency preparedness kit uh, is available to you. 
you want to go into that uh, interior room. Um, you you want to seal uh, those doors and windows with uh, with sheathing and duct tape. Uh, everything that you can uh, so that that contaminant uh, won't 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 get inside. Mm -hmm. So, also um, keep in mind that local authorities they may not be able to immediately provide you with information on what's happening or what you should do. So you need to be able to, um, you know, have access uh, to your communications, whether it be your TV, your cell phones, or, or computer, so that you can uh, know what's, what's going on uh, and when the all clear is given. Lastly, I just kind of want to differentiate differentiate clearly the difference between uh, a, a lockdown and a shelter in place. Um, so a lockdown is, uh, the idea of lockdown is for people to remain properly secured um, within that room and out of the line of vision of an active shooter until the told that area is clear, where a shelter in place, you, you just want to be inside um, where it's safe. And for those of you who, who may uh, ask the question, so an active shooter basically is, is anyone, uh, for whatever reason, uh, who decides to go into an in, in populated area and, and just start shooting. Uh, and the action is usually deliberate um, about their uh, actions uh, to, to, to shoot people. Um, so with an uh, active shooter, the lockdown procedure whether you're inside the facility or if the uh, subject is inside our facility, you want to go into that room and, and lock in or pre create a barrier uh, between you and, and that threat. And with active shooters, you want to always uh, remember to run, hide, or the, the run, hide, or fight rule uh, for active shooters. Mm -hmm. and this will conclude uh, my briefing on sheltering place. Um, for additional information, um, you can go to the, the FEMA uh, ready.gov, sheltering, also our Center for Disease Control and Prevention, our local American Red Cross, um, our health, local health departments, the Humane Society, and your local emergency management agency. Um, this will conclude my briefing. I do thank you. Um, do you want to open it up for uh, questions, anyone? Mm -hmm. uh, Dane and I are, wel are welcome to uh, answer any questions you may have. Thank you for listening. We want to thank you all for coming and um, working with us with our preparedness fair. Uh, we have uh, snacks and coffee next door and vendors that have additional information on how you can prepare. We look forward to doing this event again and seeing you in the future. Thank you. <laughs>